communion message this morning is based on a very special passage of scripture found in Luke chapter 24 verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Clopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days. He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and leaders handed them over to be condemned to death and crucified them. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, stay with us, because it was almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? while he was opening the scriptures to us. That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Please pray with me. May the Lord richly bless this reading, of his holy word. Amen. Many, many years ago, a time I will always remember, it was a Sunday evening, sometime in spring, shortly after Easter, and the minister that night was a mission gathering in the Presbyterian Church for their presbytery. It's kind of like our district. And uh, the pastor was talking about this passage. I remember a couple of the things he said. One of them was this. When the heat is on, you want to get out of town. When the heat is on, you want to get out of town. These two followers of Jesus were escaping from a bad situation. Today, imagine any bad situation any challenging situation, any tension-filled situation that you want to escape from. 
think about that a little this morning. Anything that you, you, if it were up to you, you'd just like to get out of. You'd like to fly away from, drive away from. The title of this morning's message is God's Escape Plan. And in this scripture, we're going to track some movements of God that apply to these two disciples that also apply to each of us in a variety of situations we may be facing. Number one, number one, in this story, there is God's grace. There's the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As I pray many times at Christian funerals, without grace, Psalm 130, without the grace of God, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, Lord, that you may be feared. That means awe and respect. That you may be feared. This meeting is full of God's grace. Jesus is debriefing his followers. And he's hearing their side of the story first. Isn't that cool? He wants to hear their side. Hey, tell me, you know what's up? What's going on? Tell me, how do you perceive this? <clears throat> how do you perceive this? What's going on? That he even wants to talk with them is grace. We have a God who wants to walk and talk with us every day. God's grace. This is a story of God's grace. God's escape plan always has God's grace. He wants to hear our side of the story first. It's called prayer. It's called debriefing. It's called letting it up from the Lord because he knows it's there already. Second, there is God's guidance. Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets. You do know Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's called the Pentateuch. Moses wrote those first five books of the Bible. Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them about himself in all the scriptures. Fast forward a little bit in the story. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us as as he was talking to us on the road while he was opening the scriptures to us. In my, new, in my New Life Application Bible, there were a bunch of scripture references. Genesis 3, where it is proclaimed after the fall that he will crush his heel, meaning the, snake, the, the head of the snake Jesus would crush his heel. In Numbers, the bronze snake that was lifted up, and everybody who looked at that snake, that was a prefigure of Jesus Christ, that everyone who looked up to that snake would live and find new life. Deuteronomy 18.15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet among, like among your brothers. You must listen to him. Isaiah 7, 14, The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and you will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Jesus opened the scriptures up to them. Probably talked about Psalm 22 and 69 and 110 and Isaiah 53 where it says, By his stripes, we are healed. Jeremiah 31, Zechariah 9 and 13, and Malachi 3. There is God's guidance. You're looking at this the wrong way. You're missing out on something. It, it had to happen this way. And from this, what you think is bad news, it's actually a marvelous story of good news. My grace to be with you, to guide you. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. So it's a story of grace. It's a story of God's guidance. And it's a story of God's goodness. They got up and returned to Jerusalem. They had to get out of town. Now they've got to get back to 
town. Only it's different this time. Same old, same old. Not really. They're actually going back to the same situation. Nothing in their situation has really changed other than the risen Christ is now with them. And that changes everything. Their whole approach will change. They will be part of the greatest story. They will be part of the greatest story ever told. They will have power. They will have power. They will have guts that they never had before. They will grow. They will change. We see that in the disciples. It's one of the most fantastic proofs of the resurrection. The change in the disciples. These unlearned, regular guys become the heroes of the faith. They will go from glory to glory. They will go from success to success. Let me give you a little heads up. A part of the story is not without struggle and tension. Not without struggle and tension. But they know where they're going. The risen Christ is with them. And it's the greatest story ever told. We call ourselves believers. What do we believe in? Do we believe in prayer? Or do we pray 30 seconds a day? Do we believe in prayer? Then let's pray. Do we have faith? Do we have faith? Do we share our faith? Do we live out our faith? Does it make a difference in our lives? Do we bless others? I heard this definition of love for the first time this week. I like it. Love is the desire to benefit others even at the expense of self. Love gives. Love gives. As we come to the communion table this morning, and actually the communion table is, is going to come to us, like on that walk to Emmaus, Jesus just drew right alongside of his followers, and he opened the scriptures up to them. If you want to be a part of God's escape plan, know this. God's escape plan is not an escape from, but an escape to. It's not an escape from, it's an escape to. Abraham, indeed he left his home, but God had something better for him. Moses, and the Israelites, the story of the Exodus, they left Egypt. But it wasn't just where they were going from, it was where they were going to. God said, I have a special place for you, a special land for you. I have a special relationship with you. So God's escape plan is not primarily escaping from something. It's going to God in a closer relationship with Him. It's being a part of the story of the risen Christ who will change everything in each of our lives. You know, in the Old Testament it says this, that, the, that, the, that God's Son will bring peace and the government will be on His shoulders and His government will have increase and go from glory to glory. I don't know about you, but sometimes the people I run into and the people, and sometimes what I experience myself is, I, I feel tension. I, I, I don't see the birth, I feel the labor. I, I don't see the, the goodness, I, I feel the difficulty. Let me give you a little illustration here. I, We've got a beautiful instrument here, the grand piano, given in loving memory of Eleanor Faust and Florence Cook by their families and friends, December 2008. And then as I look at this thing, it is filled with tension. The wires are very, very tense. And in fact, Ken Morton comes in here and tunes it to make sure that the tension is perfect. 
And when the tension is perfect, the most glorious sounds come out of it. Jesus had tension in his life. One time he said, I have a baptism to receive, and now constrained I am until I receive it. Man, the tensions in Jesus' life really paid off, didn't it? You know what God's people say in that? Amen. The tensions in his life, it, he was constrained. Constrained means that I'm in a relationship with God and I'm going to move forward, even in the tensions of my life. These disciples. They had to get out of town. There was so much tension. And they meet with Jesus. And because they meet with Jesus, they got to head right back into town. It's okay to escape for a season. But the goal of escape in the kingdom of God is to get closer to God. To be with Him. To have a deep relationship with Him. Where He wants to place you. Where He has you. His plan for your life. Surely I know the plan I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare, not for harm, to give you a future with hope. If you remember one thing this morning, I pray it's this. They go back to an old situation. They go back to an old situation with a new reality. The reality that He is risen. Everything is different now. Everything is different now. He is risen. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your escape plan. It's not an escape from, it's an escape to Jesus.